Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming today on this beautiful Saturday to celebrate an extraordinary man, a true character. If you have a cell phone, if you could please take it out and turn it to vibrate or silence it so it doesn't ring during one of our prayers. Thank you. Leading us is Pastor Chris Emery. Thank you so much for coming, Chris. We're here today to remember, <clears throat> celebrate, and say goodbye to Robert Samuelson. On behalf of the family, I wish to thank each of you for being here today. And that though today is difficult as we say our goodbye, we also look to God's word for promises of hope and strength. Psalm 121 says, I look to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon at night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we come to you in this time of missing and longing and grief to say goodbyes to a son, a brother, a companion. And we ask for your spirit of comfort and peace to be with us today as we celebrate this amazing life. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The family has asked a few individuals to each come and take a few moments to share a little bit about Bob. And so uh, we're going to kick things off and we're going to ask Bob Overhold to come on up and uh, share what he has prepared. Wow, what a crowd. <laughs> Whew. Um, this is kind of a short-term thing that Jill asked me if I would say a few words about Bob. And he, he and I go back a long ways. When I was 16, I was dating his sister, Dorothy. Uh, and he and I are both, she and I are both the same age. I'm 90, I'll be 92 this summer, and so would she. Well, anyway, Bob uh, came along about 11 years later than us, so... I've known Bob probably longer than most of you in this room, even some of the family. Uh, but I want to say one thing about Bob. He was an amazing person, and I think most of us already know that because of what we see on the screen of things that he's been involved in over his lifetime. Uh, his father uh, was a, a tremendous mechanic. He was a, a son of an immigrant from Sweden. And he came to this country, they came to this country, and located in Chicago. And then later in life, they, he moved to Traverse City and to get away from the allergy problems of Chicago and so forth. But anyway, his dad was, a, uh, uh, was like the rest of the Samuelson family, very intelligent. My wife, who was the oldest with the girls, she was a organist and pianist and artist and great wife. So I really loved her a lot. And, but Ralph, he was an unusual person. He started the concrete service back in 1932, and he also built the home that Ryan and, and his family are living in now in that year. And that was two, he was married in, when the Depression started in 1929. So here's a guy that started the business, built a home, raised a family, and it's a remarkable thing that one person could do in such a short period of time. Now, uh, Bob had a different upbringing than most than Dorothy and Don. Uh, Bob, because of being born 10 years younger than Dorothy and Don, uh, he went to Florida in the, in the winter with his parents because they were all fun to get out of here because the concrete service didn't do much in the wintertime because you don't build blocks or build homes as much as they like to do now. So, but he, uh, he got a good start. He went to Florida, he went to the different schools. He, uh, his education was kind of broken up, but he, he did a good job of uh, gaining the education that he needed. But Bob was a, I think the word I want to say is genius, but I don't know, 
I, I know that Don and Dorothy were kind of like that too. So <laughs> that was a family trait. These people were really in intelligent. Uh, I don't know how many of you realize that Ralph was the one that started the concrete service uh, and built the, same, built, built the house the year that Dorothy was born in 1932. And, uh, and he did so many different things, and uh, he was an outstanding person. Um, let's see. Bob, when he was, I think, in high school, had a motorcycle accident, and he hurt his, well, did he hurt his arm or his leg that time when he was in high school? Do you know, Don? Huh? Well, anyway, he had an accident. But, but everybody was gone. The parents were in Florida, and Dorothy was here alone with our daughter, and I was in Europe, so uh, Dorothy had that responsibility as well as her own responsibility. And so that was an incident in life that Bob had that was kind of bad, but he got through it all right. Then he went into the Marines. I think you've seen the pictures of him in uniform here. And he, uh, he excelled in the Marines, and I say that because they wanted him to go to OCS, which is Officer Canada School, and because he was so intelligent. But he chose not to go, and about a, I think he was on, about halfway through his training and so forth, and they allowed him to have a military discount because he, not discount, discharge, because he wanted to get out of the military. Uh, Bob, he didn't, he never finished college, but he didn't need to finish college. He was so smart. He, uh, one of these people that could pick up things very quickly. Uh, Don was telling me that Phil Pelkey, who owned an uh, airline service out here at the airport back in the 60s, uh, took Bob up and trying to teach him how to fly a plane. And he said Bob was so fast at learning that uh, he couldn't believe that a person that age could do that so quickly. But he did. He did a good job. Uh, Bob never finished college, but both Don and Dorothy did, both degrees from Michigan State College. Uh, okay. Bob, Bob was a mechanical genius, just like his dad was, and he also was an artist. He was a restorer of old vehicles, and he, had, uh, he was an excellent builder of various model planes and other things, and a great restorer of automobiles. He, he built a barn across the street from where he lives after the, the initial one burned down. And, but he was always involved with automobiles and fixing them up and painting them up. And, uh, he was an exceptional talent when it came to doing things of that nature. Uh, when Bob was quite young, his dad built a little red tractor. And, uh, and that, that little tractor is still, I think, is still in the barn up there, isn't it? And Bob used to ride that in the National Cherry Festival parade, at least in a couple of years that I remember. And he'd get on this tractor and drive her down the middle of the road, and, and uh, just like everybody else with all of their floats and things, and here was this little boy, five years old, driving. Like, and he, I think he could have driven a car back then. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. He, he, he figured things out pretty rapidly with his mind. Bob was also a great boater. He had boats on uh, East Bay. Um, he, uh, had, had a, he had one boat that he got from California. It was a real fast boat, and he had that out in uh, uh, West Bay. And he took Dorothy and I for a ride in it one time, and I don't think I've ever been scared of being in a boat, but he scared me on that trip. <laughs> that boat went so fast, and you could see the wake out behind you. It, it just was wide and long, and oh. he, was, he was kind of a daredevil, but he knew what he was doing all the time. He didn't get in any trouble. Uh, Yep, he was sure a boater. Uh, he had a lot of the motorcrafts, or watercrafts over the years. And so he was, you could call him a real, he had a Chris craft, I think a large boat. He had other smaller boats, and uh, he just loved the water. Okay, also, um, he took a stint at flying, and uh, uh, which his dad already was a, had a pilot's license. And uh, I had flown with him a few times, and uh, he was a real good mechanic, a real good pilot. He, he was everything you could ever expect a man of his talent to do. He didn't take any chances, but he did everything that he had to do. 
Um, uh, Bob used to had a hot air balloon at one time. Have you ever been up on a hot air balloon? Some of you have. I see some smiles on faces. I never had that privilege, but I don't think I would have, even if he had asked me to do that. I don't think I would have gone up with him. Because I, I, I didn't know how they steered those things. They just were just floating around in the air. So, but he, he had one. He, I don't know what he did with it finally, but unless it's still up in the barn someplace, <laughs> Jenny would know. Uh, by the way, Jenny was a really a, a treasure for Bob to have. They never had any children, but they were a great couple, and Jenny was so good with him as far as being able to support him and help him and uh, give her a lot of credit. And she has a great family herself. I met her two sons today, and, and their wives, I believe. Uh, I see one of the boys back there nodding, so he knows, knows that too. Um, let's see. Okay, all of the kids in Bob's family were very intelligent. Um, I, I believe that Ralph and Don and Bob, and I think even their mother was extremely intelligent. Uh, she was the best homemaker, cook. Uh, uh, she knew how to do everything. She could knit and, and sew. She did a lot of sewing for Dorothy. I think she made Dorothy her first formal for a dance that she went to when we were in high school. Uh, so that goes back a long ways. Uh, Don was the one that took over the plant, the concrete service plant, uh, when their father died in 1978. And, uh, and he did a good job too. His background in, was in uh, uh, some kind of housing. Uh, anyway, he learned how to build housing, how to read housing maps and everything, plans to build a house. So Don is equally as qualified as Bob was at a lot of things. Uh, let's see. Just want to say one more thing. Don was, a, or Bob was a real fan of animals. He had two uh, little miniature dogs, what do they call those? Collies, miniature collies? Shelties. Shel yeah. Shelties, that's it. They look like a collie dog, but just a third the size. And uh, they had several of those. They had a cat, I believe. And uh, Bob had, had some really interesting dogs over the year. One of them was the first one that I remember was the, a dog named Ranger. I don't know if it was a herding dog or not, but it was a fast running dog. And uh, he, he loved that dog. And I'm not sure. I think it got hit by a car because of what because of where he lived out there on, uh, uh, on Front Street and where it turns to go to uh, go west to Long Lake. And that's where the dog, I think, got hit. Well, I want to say just that to Bob, how much he meant to me, knowing him as long as I did. Dorothy and I were married 67 years, so I've known Bob even before that because when I was 16, I was dating Dorothy. and. Uh, uh, Bob was like five years old, and here, Dorothy and I were juniors in high school. So a lot of years have passed, and uh, it's been a good life for me, good life for Bob, and a good life for Don and Jill, who are, Don is, is uh, Dorothy and Bob's brother, brother, and he has done a real good job too for all of us here, and for, for Bob, we're thankful for the life that he had and that we were able to be a part of it. And I leave these things with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Bob. At this time, we would invite Mark Norton to come up and share. Hey, everybody. Um, Bob and I uh, got to know each other quite a while back. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly how I first met him. I think I met him when I was a kid once, uh, but uh, I grew up in the 
with Ryan and Andrea. Um, first time I left the house to go to a friend's house overnight was at Ryan's place. Uh, I didn't make it through the night. Um, but anyway, uh, there's just so many things that um, made Bob a really special person for me. Him and I had a lot of things in common. Um, I stories I heard about your dad, Don, you know, and about Bob just, it just gives me goosebumps to think about how similar our lives were. My dad was an engineering genius too, and my mom was crazy. Um, I was on a motorcycle before I could walk, um, riding around town in a little front pack, just a little tiny thing, and Family's into racing and doing all kinds of wild stuff. And there's 11 years between me and my next sibling. I was the youngest. And uh, as Bob and I got to know each other, we started to realize that maybe we suffered from, as my family puts it, the same illness. <sighs> I, I don't even know how I can describe this to you, but him and I, we had this huge connection over anything mechanical. And I remember one time he took us out on the Hatteras, and we already knew we had this connection and, and had bonded over cars and some other things, and, and we were... We got it. He got us on board, and he's showing us the showing us the boat, and he's like, you know, he said, "Oh, you got to see these engines." And he pulls back the the covers, and it had two twin, I think, big Caterpillar diesels in it, and and he's, you know, just so excited, and I'm excited, and and then he he starts them up, and he's like, "All right, Mark, put your hand on it," and I did, and I'm just taking it in. And then he's like, he, you know, I turned to him, he's like, what did, what did you experience? <laughs> and I said, Bob, this was just, it's a perfect symphony working together. I mean, it was just so awesome. And he, we just, you know, we, I'd be at his place and he'd be, he'd be like, I want you to drive this tractor. And so I'd drive it and, and then he'd, we just start going into all the different things about it. And we'd sit there and talk and talk and talk and share. I just don't know how to describe how those mechanical things, they were like, because it's kind of that way for me, they were like people. I mean, literally, they were, he was so in tune to all the different things that were going on all the time. And I think that's why he, he wanted to, he had so many different things. Because every time he operated something, it was an, another experience for him to dig deep into what was going on. And, uh, you know, we'd take him for, after his accident, I'd take him for rides in his Buick and do different things with him. And we'd be driving along and he'd just be like, tell me everything everything you're feeling, everything you're experiencing, and, and right down to the, you know, can, can, you hear, can you hear and feel the rear end right now just a little bit as we're decelerating? Yep, yeah, I hear that. There's a little bit of pinion noise in that, and we'd just be so in tune and so sharp with those kinds of things. And one night we were... Uh, We'd started up perhaps the, um, the, the warrior, maybe the boat you got scared on. He, he called me up and I went over and helped him uh, get it going. Um, it was in the spring and, and it, was a, it was a great experience. You know, just it felt so good for me and for him. And afterwards, we're just sitting there at the barn just talking about it. And 
he starts talking about some things that he had regretted and stuff, and I start talking about some of my failures, and a lot of it wrapped around our illness of, you know, we get going down a rabbit trail on some project or something and totally lose everything else that was important. And he, uh, I started sharing some things about how you know, God had rescued me out of some of my big failures. And he just wanted to, he, he just stopped me and he said, God? And I said, yeah, and I shared some of those things with him. And he, he wanted to know more. He just was hungry to hear how, how that worked. And and that was, you know, probably 10 years ago. Well, anyway, since then, um, I wanted to share a couple stories or a couple things that happened um, with Bob getting to know God because he, he did. And um, when he told me one day, because he knew where I was at with God, that I had experiences with God and a relationship and that God was real to me. And yet, you know, I was still able to have these same passions and still enjoy all the same things. And one day he's like, uh, he said, Mark, I, um, I prayed, uh, with my real special friend, Isabel, and I asked Jesus into my heart. And I said, wow, that's awesome. And we, we talked about some things, and over the last couple of years, he, you know, there were things he was worried about, nervous about, um, didn't understand, and scared, and you know, we we worked through some of that stuff. One of the rides in the, in the Buick, he he uh, he said, you know, I just I don't. This was before this. He said, I don't understand. Oh, it was the first time I talked about God with him. He said, I don't understand how I could ever have a relationship with God with all the things I've done. I don't understand how that could ever work. And, you know, with the, the talk about my failures and stuff and how God had rescued me, it kind of it got him thinking. And um, just over the last, this last year, uh, I got to share some things with him. Um, I prayed with him and God helped him free him from cancer and and he really was like how did this happen how how you know what's going on and um, I might share this with you here I shared this verse with him it's in Hebrews 4 16 it says let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace, the throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners, that we may receive mercy for our failures and find grace to help in good time for every need, appropriate help, just when we need it. And I said, Bob, you know, think of heaven. And think about God totally running heaven and all his place of authority. He sits on a throne and it's called the throne of grace. I said, that's like the title of it. That's, that's, that's God's love for you and his mercy and everything. It's, 
he's so good and he wants so much for us that he I can wrap around your head around that just like the throne is literally called the throne of grace given us what we don't deserve what we what we shouldn't have even and he was like yeah I get it I but anyway the last uh A few times I met with Bob here. Um, I just asked him if he needed anything, and he'd ask me to pray for him, and whether it be you know he was pain in his back or you know whatever, and and we talk about about heaven and what it's going to be like, and and uh, yeah, I can just picture Bob's sort of picture Bob's first day, I'm sure. His mansion in heaven is on the water, <laughs> you know, and uh, I'm sure he's doing some something really fast up there. But uh, he, I know that I know that he went in peace, knowing that he was at peace with God and he was free, finally free from being scared of I'll never make it I'll never 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 do enough never can't overcome my past that was his thing and he uh, I think he is definitely for sure had the every day for the last week has been more amazing than the day before, but every day being the most amazing days he's ever had. And I'm so glad that I'll get to be with him. And um, he got a head start. He'll have a few things figured out to show me when, he, when I get there. But uh, Bob was really special for me because he, he connected with me literally in a way that I've never been able to connect with someone else. And uh, he was always there for me, always asked me about me and my family and cared about what was going on in my life. And uh, he's a real special friend and I miss him. Um, but so excited that he found Jesus and found that peace. And uh, thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we're going to invite uh, the last person is Carrie Reed to come and share. Good afternoon. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Carrie. I've had the absolute pleasure of walking alongside Bob and Jenny for the past four years of his story. I knew Bob from a number of years ago and even had the privilege of accompanying them on the Hatteras <clears throat> for a Grand Travers Bay tour. Bob's love of boating, speed, sunshine, and water was definitely a passion that we shared. Bob was a unique friend and quite honestly, in many ways, was like a father figure to me, considering there is a 30 year age difference between us. Bob looked forward to his carry days and so did I. I never knew what rabbit hole of knowledge we would explore and he was always patient with me and took many of our conversations as a teachable moment. I truly enjoyed strolling down memory lane with him and the excitement he possessed sharing his life adventures with me. Bob had a zest for life that many of us could only dream about. His friendship was a gift and my memories will be cherished for a lifetime. From sand dune trips, Peace Ranch days, our trip to Nashville, Michigan to pick out Dusty. 
exploring the yak farm, trips to Frankfurt to get our A&W fix, <clears throat> to rainy days of 3D movies, and navigating the internet looking for Bob's latest obsession. His appreciation for Jenny and I never went unspoken. Bob's interests and talents surpassed most. He took great pride in showing me his paintings, model airplanes, and creative engineering of just about anything. His hot tub comes to mind. I will never look at a septic tank again the same. One thing Bob didn't lack was a compassionate and sympathetic heart. He cared about his family and he had a deep admiration for his brother Don. He cared about all of his friends and to Bob everyone was a friend. I never heard him speak poorly of anyone. He saw me through a handful of sorrow in the last four years and one thing I could count on was a sincere hug and words of encouragement. So as we bid farewell to our captain today, let's not lose ourselves in the sorrow, but find solace in the memories we shared, the laughter, and most importantly, the love. One of my favorite Bible verses captivates the very essence of this. 1 John 4:19, we love because he first loved us. The Bob I knew would wa not want us to carry on in sorrow, but to embrace life and live it to the fullest. He was definitely a perfect example of that. When I would get ready to leave his house, I'd say, be good. His response was always, well, that's no fun. <laughs> I've always said fun should have been your middle name. So to the ones left behind, I'd like to deem May 30th as flip-flop day in honor of our beloved Bob. <sighs> to Bob. It's been an absolute blessing to have shared this journey with you. You have left a footprint of gratitude on mine and Jeff's heart that will always be treasured. There won't be a day on the water that your carefree spirit won't blow in with that north wind reminding us of you or passing by the fields of sunflowers without reflecting on your botanical love. I'm not sure. I could ever eat another grilled cheese sandwich without thinking about you either, my friend. But it's the little things that will keep us smiling and keep your legacy alive. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you for everything you have done for me and my family. I love you, buddy, and may you rest in peace. Thank you, Carrie. Robert Sturgis Samuelson passed away in the comfort of his home on April 5th, 2024. He was born in Traverse City on May 30th, 1943 to Ralph and Alice Samuelson. Bob was a gifted artist, musician, inventor, and a master at building model airplanes. He was the past co-owner with his brother Don of the Concrete Service where he worked for many years using his numerous talents to help grow the business. He was a proud Marine serving six months before being medically discharged. His love for adventure and zest for life included flying hot air balloon, building and riding motorcycles, and owning several cars, motorhomes, boats, and his dogs. He especially loved hot weather and was happiest on the water in one of his many boats. Small boats, large boats, fast boats, vintage boats, and sailboats. He was also a generous friend to many. That's Bob's eulogy, and those are words doing their very best to take a special adventure-filled life and share it. Frankly, it's an impossible task. No life can really be captured in a few paragraphs, but Bob's can't even come close. As I sat and met with the family this week and heard Bob's stories, I was introduced to a man that started life even as a joyful ch child, as his brother Don said, always fun-loving and full of life. As you've heard, he was intelligent. Many people throwing the word genius around, and I've been told that even today he's wearing his thinking cap for us here. He invented and built many things, from model airplanes to even things that are still used at the business today at the concrete service. He was an artist, he was a collector, at least that's Jenny, that's, that's the nice word we decided, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, Jenny and I agreed. We'll say collector. We'll leave it there. He was an architect. In fact, many of the buildings of the concrete service he did the drawings for. He was happiest on the water. He loved his boats. And, of course, you've heard the stories of the hot air balloon because if Bob was going to do something, he did it big. He was full of adventure. He was generous to those people in his life. And he deeply loved and respected his big brother, Don. He found faith later in life, and he knew Jesus. And his last words to some family members actually were, Happy Easter. While we can't capture everything about him in words, maybe the best way to sum it up just for today is with the words that were printed on a t-shirt he owned. I'm Bob, doing Bob things. <laughs> Loss is just part of life, isn't it? The people we love, we know we're eventually going to say goodbye to. Just before Jesus said his goodbye, he was meeting with his disciples, his friends. And in John 14, he shared these words, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also can be where I am. So often we read a verse like this and maybe we don't grasp exactly what's being said because the words Jesus says to his closest friends, his, his companions, his confidants, are don't let your hearts be troubled. But he knows in the hours that are getting ready to come upon him that he would be taken from them, arrested. He would suffer and then he would die. He knew that for these 12 men, the master that they had followed, the teacher they had learned from, the, the, the man that they had walked away from everything in their entire lives to follow just him for three years, everything they knew was about Jesus. He was getting ready to be gone. They were getting ready to experience grief and loss and saying goodbye. So what was Jesus saying, don't let your hearts be troubled? How is it even possible? Well, maybe it's easier to first understand what he's not saying. What he's not saying is he's not saying to not grieve. Grief, the feeling of loss, the sadness, is part of who we are. We know that we are created in the image of God, and even as Jesus walked the earth, we see that he had feelings. He felt these feelings. At the tomb of his friend Lazarus, we read that he wept with his family members, even though he knew Lazarus would come back. So grief is part of it. It certainly doesn't mean to not miss them. We're going to miss Bob. You're going to miss him. In fact, one of the things that I've never enjoyed hearing said at funerals is eventually you'll move on. No, you won't. Now it's time to grieve and miss him and step into a new normal, a normal without Bob. But you're always going to miss him. There's going to be the memories. There's going to be the times that something happens and you think of Bob. There's going to be a, a song or you're going to feel the warm air outside or see a boat or see many, many boats and think of Bob. This word trouble actually in the original Greek means something a little bit deeper than what we read at the surface. Its original form refers to a state of hopelessness. And so what Jesus was saying to his friends, and I think what he's being said to us is in the seasons of loss, grief, missing, longing, all those feelings are real, but don't be hopeless. Don't, don't be hopeless. And, and for people that don't know Jesus, death feels final. For those who don't know who Jesus is, it, it, it's easy to begin to feel troubled. Because when death comes upon us, we don't know what's next. But for those that have embarked on this journey with Jesus, those that know who he is, and, and we follow Jesus as Bob found we have things that can come only from him. Even in these times, we certainly have hope. We read in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, we have a faith and a knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. This is that much talked about light at the end of the tunnel. There's always hope. We have peace. We have peace even in these times where 
where we hurt and there's pain and there's sadness. Philippians 4, 7, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I read that and we look at our understanding of the circumstances and recognize that they're often so small. They're so limited. I don't know about you, but there's often times where I want answers. I want to know why something happens. I want the reason. I want to know what maybe I did to deserve this or I want to be able to fix it. Ultimately, I want to be able to control it. The reality is in this life, we will never find the answers. We'll never have all the reasons. We will never be able to fix it, and we certainly can't control it. So if peace rises and falls on me, I'll never have it. But our peace comes ultimately from God. And that verse is the promise of peace, even in the moments where peace shouldn't be there. Ultimately, we find our strength in the times where we need it the most. In the coming days, coming weeks, coming months, there's going to be a lot of Bob sightings in your life. A lot of things that, oh, Bob, Bob would have loved that. You know what Bob would have said here? You know what Bob would have done? Remember what Bob did. I'm sure there's plenty of those stories. So grieve him. Miss him. Continue to love him. But don't be hopeless. Bob wasn't hopeless. As Mark shared, he, he got over that fear because he found one thing. That was Jesus. Bow your heads with me as we close. Father, we thank you for Bob. We thank you for the life. We thank you for the impact he had on so many. In these moments of sadness, of heavy hearts, of just grieving a family member, a friend, someone who's loving and caring and therefore was loved and cared about. We can't rely on this world or our life or anything we can understand to bring us what we need, but through you, through you we have it. Through you we have the promise of peace. We have the promise of strength. We have the promise of joy. Ultimately, we have the promise of a hope that extends far beyond our days here. Thank you that our hearts are not troubled because of you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Lindsay is going to come and give us some instructions for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you, Pastor Chris. And thank you all for coming today to celebrate and honor Bob. At this time, you're welcome to come forward and pay your last respects. We also have some goodies out in the foyer that you're welcome to help yourself to. And then we will be making our way to Oakwood Cemetery, where we will have military honors to honor his time in the Marine Corps. All are welcome to come to the cemetery if you wish. Thank you again for coming. Go in peace.